we're going to go through a complete heat convection problem here from start to end. We have a solar panel here which is in the wind, a soft wind of 2 meters per second, or maybe that's a hard wind, I don't actually know. It is 0.5 meters long in the direction parallel to the wind, and in the direction perpendicular to the wind it is 1 meter long. And the surface temperatures are given, 100 degrees Celsius here and 25 degrees Celsius here. So to calculate the convection coefficient, we're going to first need the Nusselt numbers, which are in turn functions of the Reynolds and Prandtl numbers. But there's two different Nusselt numbers, one for laminar flow and one for turbulent flow. So we're going to need to first figure out what type of flow we're dealing with, which we can find from the Reynolds number, which is velocity times the characteristic dimension. In this case, it is length, and it is known. Velocity is also known divided by nu, which is the kinematic viscosity of the fluid. So the kinematic viscosity of the fluid is not yet known, and we can figure it out by bringing up a thermal fluids table. This is a property of gases for air at atmospheric pressure, which we're assuming. And we want the kinematic viscosity at a specific temperature, which we will call the film temperature. So as fluid passes over the plate, it's going to be at air temperature here before it takes on any of the, heat, the uh, plate's heat. This is heat radiating out due to convection. And as it travels along the plate, it's going to get hotter and hotter, and the boundary layer is going to get thicker and thicker. And so we're going to have an infinite number of different Prandtl numbers and an infinite number of different convection coefficients for the different positions along the plate. So what we're interested in is in the average, and we're going to use the film temperature to get all of our numbers. The te film temperature is just the temperature along that, that boundary layer, it's the average. So we take the temperature of the air, we're going to add 273 because we're working with Kelvin in this problem. And the temperature of the surface, again, plus 273 divided by 2, and this is going to equal 335.5 degrees Kelvin. So this is the temperature we're going to work with. Let me bring that table up again. 335 is in between these two numbers, and we are looking for the kinematic viscosity, nu, and these numbers are times 10 to the minus 6. So we see that 335 is somewhere between 350 and 300, and so we're going to need to interpolate. I can, you can think of interpolation as something like this. If you have t on the x-axis and nu on the y-axis, there's a relationship, but it's not linear. And that's why you have a table rather than just a function. So if we zoom in on this part, we create a box for that. Again, nu and t, it's going to look almost linear. So the first thing we're going to do is find the slope, the slope of this curve at this point. Well, the rise will be the difference in nu, so that'll be 20.92 minus 15.89. That is the change in nu divided by the change in temperature, which is the run. So this will be the run, which is 350 minus 300. Now we have the slope of this curve. Now what we need to find is the actual change in x from, or the change in temperature from where we, from here to where we're actually going. And I don't blame you if that didn't make a whole lot of sense to you, because I didn't explain it very well. But just remember, it's just be consistent is the point. So you start here where the ruler is, you subtract here where this is, in the denominator, where the ruler is to where this is. And again, 350, where the ruler is to where this is. I like to think of it as delta nu over delta t, and these of course aren't the same delta t, 
the delta t's cancel. So that gives you this value. And then remember, you zoomed in at this box. So you need to add your initial new value, which is 15.89. Now I encourage you to stop the video, look at, look at this table and do all of this on yourself because watching these videos isn't gonna help you at all if you, if you aren't actually working along the problems with me. So if you do this calculation, you were gonna come up with a value for, and I'm trying to find it, 17.35. I'm rounding, times 10 to the minus six. You can't see it here, but this is 10 to the minus six, right there. So that's the value for new. Some other, a couple other things you're gonna need is the thermal conductivity of the air and the Prandtl number of the air. And you use the same process. Bottom minus top, bottom minus, divided by bonus, bottom minus top, and we multiply this by bottom minus this value. And then we add our initial Prandtl number, same thing for the kinematic, or the thermal conductivity rather. rather. And so we have a couple different numbers. We're gonna get the Prandtl number, we're gonna get the thermal conductivity of the air, and we're gonna get the kinematic viscosity. All right, let me make some room here. So we get the, we have the kinematic viscosity for the fluid we're working with, the average value. And if we take a velocity of two, the characteristic dimension of 0 0.5, and a kinematic viscosity of 17.35 times 10 to the minus six, we are gonna get a Reynolds number of 5.8 times 10 to the four. Now the cutoff for these is five times 10 to the fifth was the cutoff Reynolds number, the critical Reynolds number. When it is no longer a laminar flow, it turns into turbulent flow. Why five times 10 to the fifth? That's just what people saw for this specific geometry. Since we are less than that number by an order of magnitude, then we are in laminar flow and we're gonna use this equation. So that, that was a good start. Now we can calculate the Nusselt number. And we're gonna use 5.8 times 10 to the four. And if you calculated the Prandtl number through interpolation on the table, it's gonna come out as 0 0.707. You could probably just use 0 0.707. And the Reynolds number is square rooted. And this is to the one third. When you solve for the Nussel number, you're gonna get a value of 242. So I'm looking at my notes for this video and I just realized that if you did interpolate, in, interpolation for the Prandtl number, you should come up with a value of 0.705. And if your numbers aren't the exact same as mine, it's probably because I'm just not, I'm rounding off when I'm writing here and my notes are a little bit more exact. But you'll have a Nussel number of 247. Again, it's dimensionless, just as is the Reynolds number. Once you have the Nussel number, you can solve for H. If you know the definition of the Nussel number, it's a little bit of algebra is 247. This is the Nussel number times the thermal conductivity of air, 27.4 times 10 to the minus three, so 0 0.0274. And this is divided by the characteristic length, the characteristic dimension, in this case it is length. And you will come up with a value for convection coefficient of 13, Point three about and this is in watts per square meter so this is the Nussel number this is the thermal conductivity and this is the length 
So this is watts per meter Kelvin. This is meter, so the units work out. This is dimensionless. So this is, for this heat situation, it's hot here, it's cold here, you have wind going this much, and this is a characteristic length. This is how much it will radiate, 13.3 watts per square meter. So if we take Newton's law of cooling, we'll do it over here for convection. Q equals the convection coefficient times the area times delta T. We have all these values now. And so if we plug in H, 13.3 times an area, 0.5 times 1 meters squared times a temperature difference of 75 degrees. We are going to need a whopping 497.9498 watts to keep this at steady state. So the sun will need to shine a total of 498 watts onto the solar panel to keep everything as it is. And this problem might seem a little bit dumb, and if you're thinking that, the reason you're thinking that is because you're right, because you can't really change the sun except for shading the solar panel, and that, that doesn't make any sense. That defeats the purpose. But hopefully this, despite the kind of nonsensical nature of the problem, this gave you some background on how to work these thermal fluid problems. So, well, thanks for watching, I guess. And um, we'll work some more problems. This is, I mean, you're never going to, this can take a lot of different forms. And this is a pretty simple form here. So it gets harder.